Hello, my name is Daniel Hewson, and I'm going to give you an introduction to microbiome analysis using Diamond and Megan. Here's an outline of my presentation. There's a number of different topics that I'd like to touch upon, and so I'm just going to get started. First of all, I'm going to give you a mini introduction to microbiome analysis. As you probably know, traditionally microbes are studied in culture, and when we look at individual organisms, we are interested in the genome and the genome is the entire DNA sequence of a single organism. But most microbes don't live in isolation and many can't be cultured. And so we like to look at microbes in the context of other microbes. And when we do so, the collection of microbes in a specific theater of activity is called a microbiome. And then the, micro, the metagenome is the entire DNA sequence of a microbiome, all the genomes in that collection of microbes that you're looking at. There's lots of different sources for microbiomes that are studied. So people are interested in soil samples, water samples, seabed samples, air samples, ancient bones, host associated microbiomes, in particular the human microbiome and the list can be extended. Let's go back to the year 2005. You may recall that in the year 2005, the first second generation or next generation sequencing te technology was introduced, the, the 454 sequencer. This sequencer was originally intended for genome sequencing, but of course, the question was, what else can we apply the sequencer to? For example, can we use next generation sequencing to sequence ancient DNA? What about metagenomic DNA? Can we use next generation sequencing for metag metagenomic DNA? Of course, we all know the answer today, but back in those days, it was not known. And the first paper to look into this was a paper on mammoth DNA. And so here, yeah, the question was, can we sequence DNA from a mammoth bone that is 28,000 years old has been preserved in permafrost. So this was, looked, this was looked into using 454 sequencing and 300,000 reads were collected of length 95 base pairs. Back in those days, that was a large number of reads. Today, of course, we wouldn't even consider 300,000 reads for purposes of debugging, let alone of analysis. But it was shown that yes, you can use next generation sequencing by ancient DNA. 50% of the, these reads that were collected uh, could be shown to be mammoth DNA. And uh, this paper contained the first metagenomic analysis based on second generation sequencing. And so this was the glorified metagenomic analysis back in, uh, in that paper, a very high level mapping of sequences to different types of organisms. The basic idea that was born in that paper was to use BLAS-X alignment of the non-host reads against the NR database, the database of non-redundant protein sequences, and then to use what's called the naive LCA algorithm to assign each read to a taxon based on its protein alignments. So we started developing a program for making this possible. And back in 2006, we had the first Megan metagenomic analysis pipeline. And this is a very simple pipeline. You start off with your 454 sequences. You run BLAST-X against the NR database. And then we, the Megan program would pass the BLAST-X output file and allow you to interactively explore and analyze the results. So this was Megan version 1.0, which was used for this pie chart and for a refined analysis of that data that you can see here. So here's a Megan analysis of those 300,000 non, those 300,000 reads. The computational bottleneck back in those days was, and for many years continued to be, 
the alignment of the reads against the NR database. Back in 2006, as I said, data sets were very small by today's standards, 300,000 reads, and the NCBI NR protein database was also very small. It only contained about 3 million entries, about 1 billion letters. Nevertheless, BLASTX of those sequences took a couple of weeks on a small cluster. And today, data, typical data set sizes are a thousand times larger. And the NCBI database has also grown by a factor of 100. And we will return to that topic in a moment. Just for context, uh, the um, 2006, this paper uh, was published, one of a number of papers that explored the application of metagenomics to potentially mm, problems of potential medical interest, for example, obesity uh, in modified mice, looking at the shift in taxonomic composition inside the gut and also in the changes in the functional capacity of the gut microbiome. That was a small data set considered in that paper and similar papers. One of the first quite large data sets was published in this paper here in the MetaHit 2010 paper where roughly 600 gigabases of sequence was produced to study the gut microbiome of 124 European subjects and one of the main results that came out of that was this list of species that are present in most of the individuals with a coverage of at least 1%. And the analysis back in those days was done by BLASTX at the Supercomputer Center in Barcelona, followed by a Megan analysis. So the theme here is as metagenome data sets get bigger, the computational issues become more severe. As another example of a metagenome data set that was using quite a large number of reads was this study uh, in Janet Jansen's group where they looked at permafrost cores, two cores drilled into permafrost. And then the question is what happens to the microbial communities in permafrost as the permafrost Thaws. And so they did an analysis here based on function showing that, I guess in a nutshell, samples taken from the active layer of the permafrost start out similar and stay similar, whereas samples that start off in the permafrost layer, the layer that's usually always frozen, start off functionally quite different, but as they thaw, they become, a more, become more and more similar. In any case, back in those days, the analysis was based on 250 million Illumina reads and uh, the authors estimated a requirement of about 800,000 CPU hours, which they obtained at the Supercomputer Center in Berkeley. And so that's roughly one year on 100 cores, one year, one wall clock year on 100 cores if you want to analyze this size data set. And so this is an issue that we looked at quite closely because it is apparent bottleneck in metagenome analysis. And so here's a basic question. You have your metagenomic reads, usually on the order of 100 to a couple of hundred base pairs long, and you want to align them against protein reference sequences to, to do an analysis. And so the way that's traditionally done is to translate in all six different reading frames, and then to do what's called translated alignment. You align the protein translation of your reads against the protein database to get such hits like displayed here. And uh, so we came up with a new approach to this, a program called Diamond that replaces BLASTX on microbiome sequencing data. So, for purposes of microbiome analysis, the sensitivity of diamond is quite similar to that of BLASTX on short reads. However, diamond is much, much faster. And so we published this in 2015, and this has become one of the main tools, if not the main tool for doing protein analysis of metagenomic data. Back in that paper, we showed that 
diamond gives you a speed up over blast X of a factor of about 20,000, for example, when you're looking at that permafrost data that I mentioned. So 20,000 times faster with roughly the same sensitivity. Here's a more recent application of this approach. This was a pilot study undertaken at the University K Hospital here in Tübingen. So two volunteers went through a course of antibiotics and the sample gut samples or stool samples were taken before, during and after the course of antibiotics and uh, quite large, quite a large amount of sequencing was done, roughly 60 million reads per sample. And so that's roughly 80, 800 million reads in total. And so the initial analysis of this data is to compare it to align it against CNR protein database. So we have 12 samples, roughly 800 million sequencing reads. And how long does that take if you're using diamond? Well, here's your 816 million reads. To compare those against the NR database took 62 hours on a single computer, 62 wall clock hours. And it gave rise to 9.9, .9, nearly 10 billion protein alignments of the 816 million reads, 620 million were aligned, so quite a high alignment rate. And then once you have those alignments, you still need to analyze the alignments to, to estimate the functional and taxonomic content of the samples. So that was done using another program called Meganizer that we will get back to soon, which took another five hours. So from beginning to end, from the moment you start the first program to the moment where you actually have some files that you can open up, open up in the interactive program start looking at, that's three days on a single server. Three days in contrast to a year on a hundred cores. Okay, so what does, once you've aligned your reads against the protein reference database, the first three computational questions that one might pose are these three questions here. So you've got your hundreds of samples, you've done your sequencing, you have many, many sequencing reads, and now you want to do the basic computational analysis. And the, so the first three computational questions are, who is out there? So this refers to the question of figuring out what the taxonomic content of the sample is, which different organisms are present. Second question is, what are they doing? What's the functional content of the sample? What genes are present? What's the functional potential of the sample? If you have metatranscriptomic data, what's actually being expressed? Third computational question is, how do they compare? So usually in metagenomics and microbiome analysis, it's all about comparison. You're looking at samples from different locations or in different states here, for example, you might have an obese mouse versus a lean mouse and you want to see whether what the, the systematic differences might be in the content of the gut microbiome. So Megan is a tool that allows you to address these problems. It's an interactive tool. And so it does provide you ways of exploring the taxonomic content of a sample, provides different ways of exploring the functional content. You can compare multiple samples simultaneously in Megan, and you can do a number of calculations, for example, PCOA analyses of your samples. And there, is, there are many other advanced, more advanced features, for example, so-called gene-centric assembly, where you assemble individual gene sequences rather than trying to assemble whole genomes. So let's have a little closer look at taxonomic content. So here is one of those samples from that antibiotic pilot study that I mentioned. This is not the whole sample. This is just a test data set where I've subsampled 1 million of the reads and you can see at the taxonomic rank of phylum, what the makeup of this sample is. Mostly bacteriodatus, uh, quite a few firmicutes, but then a number of other 
types of sequences as well. So this is a high level representation of this, the content of this particular sample. You can see that the different circles, the size of the circles are shown here indicates how many reads have been assigned to a particular node. We unclapped some of the taxonomic tree that's shown here from left to right to the genus level, then we can see the different genera and we can see that Bacteroides is one of the main genera here. Aristipus and Fecobacterium. And we can go even further into more details, look at the species, we're gonna some of the special species level assignments of the reads into sample. And there are a number of ways that you can explore the data further. For example, you can drill all the way down into the individual reads and their alignments. For example, if you're interested in this particular node here, you can, op you can open up this viewer that allows you to go in and say, okay, what do the alignments actually look like? So while you're usually not interested, you're not always interested in these details, some, for some questions you might want to dive deep down into your data and that is possible using Megan. The way that Megan allows you to compare samples is it allows you to open multiple samples simultaneously in what's called a comparative document. And then you see how the different samples map to the different taxa in the taxonomy. And there are different ways that you can display this here. For example, they're using mini bar charts on each of the nodes to represent the number of reads that have been assigned to those nodes. And you can see down here in the legend for, for different samples. And again, you can see here that the, how the scaling works. And quite often you might not use a linear scaling, but I've shown here square root scaling just so that it's makes it easier to find those nodes where there are counts, non-zero counts. Yeah, so here you can see 12 samples are shown here together. And Megan provides a number of different tools for refining the analysis here, for example, is a heat map for those same 12 samples. Here you can see uh, taxonomic content for, and then here we're showing your Z score and then a clustering uh, of the rows and columns. And what you can see here quite clearly is that these first three samples cluster together. You can see that up here. And these happen to be the three samples of one of the two participants where, where they were not yet taking antibiotic or had finished, long finished taking the antibiotic in the same over here. So for Bob, before he started taking the antibiotic, the day that he started and long after the study was finished. And so they, they clustered together nicely. Then the three intermediate days where Bob was under the influence of an antibiotic and the same Alice was under the influence of the antibiotic uh, clustered here. So there's different ways that you can analyze the data. And the kind of question that you can then answer is, for example, this question here, does the microbiome rebound? That's a typical question that people are interested in, for example, in the context of, of taking antibiotics. And here you can see this is, <clears throat> so here I've labeled the samples. Plus means uh, this is uh, during the course of antibiotics, minus means uh, outside of the course of antibiotics and the numbers represent the different days and A is the one person, B is the other person. So you can see here, Alice starts off day zero. This is a, this is, this dot represents the microbiome ta taxonomic content on day zero. And then on day one, the, this, the fact that these dots are very close together uh, means that the taxonomic profiles for these days are very similar. That's the nature of a PCOA plot. They're more closely close two points out to each other, the more similar they are in terms of their taxonomic content. Day three started two days into the course of antibiotics. It's quite a big difference. Profiles changed quite a lot compared to the day zero. And then day six is even further away from day zero. So even more modified microbiome. And then day eight, so two days after finishing the 
course of antibiotics, we are kind of turning the corner. And then at day 34, we've come quite close to the initial profile. And if you look at Bob, Bob goes through the same circular trajectory. Functional content. For example, you can bin the reads in Megan using eggnoggin here, for example, now I'm using a linear scale just to show you there's different ways to scale how data is displayed. And uh, say we want to go one level into the eggnog classification. So eggnog is an extension of the classic cog cluster, clusters of orthogonal groups. You can see. <coughs> This extended classification, you can see the, the, the different types of cogs or eggnogs indicated by these different letters. Now I'm using a square root scaling. To, and now we're going all the way in, say you're interested in say cell motility, in particular flagellin genes, and uh, we can uncollapse down to this level of detail and uh, the counts you get quite small. So now I'm actually scaling those bar charts by log. So you can see that this is what the, the scaling factor looks like. But the basic message here is that the reads get binned by function based on a, a classification of function, this particular case, eggnog, but there are other ones supported by Megan as well. And you can use that to search for and compare the content of your samples. So as I mentioned, there are different classifications. So in terms of taxonomic binning, Megan provides the NCBI taxonomy and also the GTDB taxonomy. For functional binning, you can uh, use Interpro, Eggnog, Seed, Keg for Keg. Uh, license is required, so there you would use the ultimate edition of Megan rather than the community edition. And something that we've added quite recently is a uh, standalone classification of enzymes, the EC numbers. Okay, so if you want to do metagenomic analysis using Diamond plus Megan, what does a pipeline look like? Well, there's a command line program called Meganizer, which is usually used in this context. Meganizer does the taxonomic and functional binning of the reads, it indexes all data, and it doesn't produce a new file, but rather it extends the output file of Diamond. So this means that if you're using the Diamond plus Megan pipeline for any given sample, you only have to deal with two files, okay? so you. Initially, you have your FASTQ file that has come off the sequencer. And sometimes uh, you might want to do some quality control, maybe host read removal if you have a host associated sample, maybe some contamination filtering if contamination is a problem. But but as a, as a, for in the first pass, you can just take the FASTQ straight off the sequencer and then compare against the NR database using Diamond and you get what's called a Diamond Alignment Archive, a DAA file. Now this DAA file is then run through a program called Meganizer. So Meganizer reads the DAA file, analyzes all the reads based on the alignments that it finds, and then it attaches a, an additional block to the bottom of the file and turns the diamond DAA file into what we call a meganized DAA file. Once a DAA file has been meganized, then you can open it in the Megan program. So here's that pipeline again. So usually you can have multiple fast Q files from multiple samples. You run them all through diamond, you get a whole set of diamond alignment archives. Each one of these is subjected to Meganizer analysis, and once that's done, <coughs> and that's usually done on a server, you then open those using Megan. So you could be running Megan on the server, or you could download the Meganized files onto your local computer. And the third option 
uh, and this is what we use a lot, is there's a software called Megan server that you can run on the server, which and it serves data to instances of Megan. So you can please sit in, in your office running Megan on your local computer and it will be talking to a server somewhere where the files are kept. Okay, so, so far we've talked about sequencing, metagenome reads, the analysis of the individual reads. What about assembly? First of all, I wanna talk about the, a paradox that arises in microbiome analysis. So a lot of work in microbiome analysis is done or has been done, is still being done using short reads. So reads produced by Illumina sequences. These are usually on the order of a hundred to a couple of hundred base pairs long, and uh, they are very plentiful. It's easy to produce millions, hundreds of millions or billions of reads from, from metagenomic or microbiome samples. Because the reads are so short, it seems sensible that you'd want to assemble these reads into nice long pieces of sequence, especially if you have many, many reads, you would hope that you can build, you know, chromosome scale contexts from the short reads. However, unless you put in a huge amount of work, or even if you do put in a huge amount of work into the assembly, the resulting sequences are usually disappointingly short. You might get a couple of, you might, if you, you know, doing advanced assembly, you might get a couple of contexts that could be measured in hundreds of keto bases. But most of the data that you're gonna get, most of the contexts are gonna be measured in hundreds of bases or a few keto bases. So very short sequences. Uh, you very seldomly see assembled sequences that are on the scale of chromosome length. Okay, what about long reads as produced by Pack bio sequences or Oxford nanopore sequences. They are very long. They're usually longer than the average assembled short read. So you go through all the pain of doing a short read assembly and what you, uh, what you obtain are sequences that are on average much shorter than the, the average long reads are. They are of higher quality, the assembled context that is true, but the length is usually much shorter. However, if you then take the long reads and run assemblers on the long reads, what you get is are very long reads. In fact, you, it's not unusual to get complete chromosomes, circular closed chromosomes out of a metagenome data set if you're using long read sequencing technology. And so this is a paradox. While short reads, would benefit most from assembly. It's actually the long reads that you want to assemble. Assembly of short reads is optional. You can do it if you want, but whether it's worth the trouble is gonna depend on what you're trying to do. But for long reads, you should always assemble them because what you get are complete chromosomes. Okay, so here's a, an image from a paper. I'm just showing you this to show you the limitation of short read metagenomics. See all these, there's many, many circles. This is, this is just shows you that the, the genomes in this, in this data set are fractured into tiny, tiny pieces. You get these clouds of sequences rather than individual discrete genomes. And now let's look at some long read metagenomic data. This is from a project undertaken in Singapore together with Rowan Williams in the context of wastewater treatment, looking at a bioreactor uh, running some wastewater. This is uh, old data by today's standards, 2018. If you run a min ion back in 2018, you'd get about six gigabases a sequence. And if you're very careful with library preparation, you can get, you could get nine kilobase mean sequence length. Here's the bioreactor, here's the sequencer. And uh, from this, we produced which I think is a very nice paper where we report on seven high quality genomes. So here's that data. 
of the six gig basis sequence, average length nine kilo basis. We run it through the unicycler pipeline, which under the hood uses MinASEM for assembly and Racon for polishing. And what we get was, or consensus, Racon does consensus, what we got was 1700 contigs, <coughs> average length of 61 kilo basis, but going up to five megabases in size. Okay, and here's a bandage visualization of those different contigs. You can see there are multiple closed circular uh, sequences here. And uh, yeah, here's the Megan binning of those contigs. And if we look at those in more detail, you can see that there's seven contigs or seven bins that come out as high quality draft genomes that have high completeness and low contamination. So if you look at the result of this program called CheckM, CheckM looks at the collection of sequences and tries to figure out how complete that is in terms of being a, a genome and how contaminated it looks. And that's, this analysis is done based on single copy marker genes. It looks at the type of genome that is represented by a bin. And then it says, okay, if you're, if this really is Bacteriodatus bacterium, for example, then it should have such and such single marker genes. How many of those does it have? That's how it determines the completeness. And then how many of those single copy genes appear in multiple copies? That's how contamination is estimated. So you can see here a lot of very highly complete genomes with low contamination. And as we go down the list, we have uh, less completeness and uh, slightly more contamination. So a very nice assembly of this bioreactor microbiome. And here you can see uh, using PROCA, what we get in terms of rRNAs and tRNAs and coding sequences. And here are pictures of those assembled genomes. So, for long read analysis, this is what we would recommend as a pipeline. You take your FASTQ files that you've generated from base calling, run them through an assembler, for example, the Unicycler pipeline to get an assembled FASTA file. This is then subjected to diamond analysis, and then the output diamond files are mechanized. And it's important to note that Long, the properties of long read sequences and long read contexts are quite different from those short read sequences, short read con contexts. And so both diamond and mechanized have been extended so as to include a long read mode that takes uh, special properties of long sequences into account. And so you run this pipeline and then you open those files up in Megan and then can do interactive exploration and analysis of your long read assemblies. Here's another view of that same pipeline with some timing. So it used to be that the sequencing would take about a day and then you require another 15 hour for base calling. Uh, today, these days you would use what's called a minute in IT, which is a, a separate device that does the base calling while you're sequencing. So basically you don't, once you finish with the sequencing, you have the sequences, don't have to wait for the base calling. Then you run that through unicycler pipeline. It took us two hours for those six gig that we had. Run that through diamond another two hours. And then takes, doesn't take very long. Megan to import that to Megan takes on the order of minutes. And then this is an important step that I hadn't mentioned previously. If you want to run that program check in that looks at completeness and contamination of bins. Or if you want to run PROCA that does prokaryotic annotation, then you have to do some frame shift correction on the data. Uh, and that can be done within Megan. So Megan uh, can take long read sequences and perform frame shift correction so that the, the resulting sequences can be processed by programs like CheckM and PROCA that do a naive six frame translation of sequences. And then you can look at the annotated genomes. You can annotate your genomes and you can, can and, uh, 
analyze incompleteness and contamination. Okay, so that's just a rough overview of what you can do with Megan without really telling you too much about the details of how to do it if you're interested in running Diamond and Megan on short read or long read microbiome sequences. And we've just published a, a detailed protocol for doing that in current protocols. And so here's the URL, or you can just snap that with your phone and then it will take you to that article. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. These are a number of people that I would like to thank in the context of this work and funding sources. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.